the coast of Egypt could cut a cable, but anyway. <laughs> I think we agreed that that was fairly unlikely. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something that's fairly evident from, uh, from this picture, actually, aside from the reach of our network nowadays, which is obviously more than just one cable system running up the east coast. And uh, the, the hint is in the word coast. As you see, the networks that, uh, that CECOM is involved in and that uh, generally tend to come to a beach or a cliff. And uh, one of the great advantages of uh, being in a, uh, a company that's involved in international uh, networks and, uh, and cable systems is that uh, you get to stand on a beach occasionally and you look out and you can imagine that somewhere beneath the ocean is your wonderful cable running for tens of thousands of kilometres. You can see some palm trees on distant islands, some fishermen, hopefully not with anything that's going to enable them to cut cables. The unfortunate thing is that behind you is actually where all your customers are. And you've got to get to those guys because uh, that's obviously why you've built these, uh, these networks, why you've invested in them, why you've taken capacity on uh, networks that not only run uh, up the west coast, but up the east coast, and go to, uh, to Europe as well as to the Middle East and uh, through to South Asia as well. And so my discussion today is really about how do we get inland and start servicing some of those customers. When Seacom landed in 2009, it was obviously pretty transformational. And uh, the cables that have followed, the Easies, the Teams, the WAX, uh, and the others that are hopefully still to come, the Aces and such like, are, uh, uh, have continued that transformation as well. And the transformation has been in terms of availability, choice, competition, and probably from a consumer perspective, and most interestingly, cost. Prices have dropped dramatically, obviously, from what we used to pay, whether it be for satellite or for the limited capacity that was available to some markets, and uh, South Africa was reasonably lucky in that extent, but not to others. That transformation continues but it's not going fast enough, and there are a number of reasons why that's not the case. When Seacom came on board, there were a few things that were absolutely critical to us. One, the fact that we were privately owned and autonomous, we, could, we were neutral, and we were very open. And in fact, uh, the principles of open and equitable access have been critical to us all the way through, and for many of our customers. We have cable stations where people can come and connect. We don't charge an arm and a leg to do so. Where we go into data centres, unfortunately we're starting to see the growth of neutral and capable data centres throughout Africa as well. Then customers can cross-connect to us at a very easy and, uh, uh, and reasonable price as well. And those things are helping to drive some of the developments, some of the benefits that we're getting from broadband. If you look back at the situation uh, in 2011 even, and uh, ah, my little red thing is working. You get, rather than looking at uh, the numbers, think about the thickness of some of these lines. If you look at the amount of capacity that was running between continents, North America and Europe, South America and the US, Asia Pacific, a massive market as well, uh, and even Europe to Asia Pacific, uh, an interesting route nowadays, and compare that to what we were seeing in terms of Africa's reach into Europe and to, uh, uh, and to Asia Pacific, then uh, we were pretty thin. And this was 2011, so this was even two years after. It's continued to grow, but I can tell you that the growth rates that we're seeing in Africa at the moment, whilst good, are still less than what we see on this route. So compound growth from an international perspective, is probably about 10 full percentage points below what we see in terms of this route here. And even on some of the routes between across the Atlantic, which is the most traversed and the most competitive and the lowest price routes in the world, uh, are still probably as, as high as we're getting in Africa. What are some of the reasons for that? Well, we know that we've seen pretty good growth because I mean, this will give you an idea in terms of what we saw in terms of back in 2009 with the pre-CECOM market. 
And then what we've basically sold, I've just put up to 2011 data, and that gives you a, a rough idea of the growth rates that we've seen just based on what's come out of CECOM, let alone out of other cable systems, and there are a number of those serving these East Coast markets as well. So we know that demand growth is not tapering off. We know that now more mobile devices in the world than people. Smartphones, largest consumers of mobile data, and we cannot underestimate the importance of the mobile environment to Africa. It is the one continent that has the highest penetration and usage of mobile for, uh, for data access. And we also know that it will help us to overcome a lot of the last mile challenges that we face already. So we've seen mobile data traffic growth of about 104% compound being forecast. Internet penetration growing 60% up through last year, over the previous two years. MTN saying more far smartphones sold than normal phones. And hopefully now that we're getting a slightly better BlackBerry uh, OS as well, they will be truly smartphones uh, for South Africa. Uh, and all of those things are great. But we also know from our studies and from talking to people and talking to our colleagues that in fact there remains a pretty large gap between potential demand, what people would like to be using and be able to do at the right price point and with the right access and the, the right infrastructure, and what we're still seeing. Now, when we talk about some of the gaps in the market, we're not just talking about fibre from cable stations to various towns or crossing over. We're talking about the whole infrastructure that's missing. And in many cases, that involves obviously fibre, but it will involve involve also potentially last mile wireless, LTE, and hopefully some of the higher order 3G and the newly defined 4G, which I think is 3.75G actually. Uh, and, uh, but it also means data centers, it means power, it means skills, it means processing capability, it means reliability and resilience that is not there even in many of those networks today. And one of the things that will help to change that, we think, is cloud. Africa does have a history of leapfrogging technologies, and that tends to be the case around the globe. As we come into markets, developing markets, we tend to see that we bypass some of the older technologies and jump straight ahead. Cloud offers a great opportunity, we think, to, uh, to Africa as well. And we've seen that already in terms of the move to, uh, to mobile that I was talking about. If we can utilise and harness cloud services properly, and we're not just talking about remote email and hosted exchange and those sort of things, but true platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, then we can start to fill in some of those gaps. And we can also hopefully bypass some of what is fairly historically intensive and costly infrastructure models. So if you go to any of the innovation hubs in rapidly growing and developing in, in Africa, across the continent. You'll find a number of people who are developing some wonderful solutions and apps. Quite often they've done them on laptops that are five years old or older. Their network has consisted of USA, USB sticks that they pass from one to the other. And they have developed some things which have quite a lot of capability and potential, whether they be accounting systems on mobile apps for Kenyan specific applications, or other developments that are going to enable e-health and even better utilisation of power infrastructure. What is missing for many of those people is the ability to find somewhere to how, somehow play those out. Because they haven't been able to afford a network already to, uh, for their developing environment, their ability to afford a network to actually deliver those services is pretty low. The cost is way too high in terms of going and buying it. However, if through cloud we can develop and deliver virtual machines, platform as a service and the infrastructure as a service so that they pay for what they need and they pay for that on a daily rate or a monthly rate, then in fact we get, are going to see much more of these innovations, African innovations, African solutions to African problems coming to market much more quickly. So obviously the bottleneck from our perspective has moved inland. There was a bottleneck at the coast in terms of access to, to data, to capacity, 
at the right price. I think we have largely overcome that and it continues to improve day by day. There is no shortage of capacity on cable systems now. And there won't be. When asked the question, how much capacity can your cable system be lit to, my answer is, well, this morning it was probably this amount. Tomorrow it's probably this amount. It changes constantly. Rakesh spoke about, in terms of lighting up uh, the DFA fibres, what we can do there. And a little bit later I'm going to talk to you a little about a new investment we're looking at making and we're expecting that on each fibre, and this is a subsea fibre, quite different to terrestrial, we're expecting that we can get in excess of 10 terabytes on every fibre. Okay. And that's new technology that's come out in the last six to eight months and has been proven already and in fact is already in use on uh, the rest of our network. But that will change again and pretty soon we expect that we could probably get fairly close to doing 30 to 40 terabytes. <coughs> now, as a guide, there is probably well less than a terabyte of total capacity going out of South Africa at the moment. And across Africa as a whole, there is probably just over a terabyte of capacity if we exclude the northern, uh, uh, especially the Egyptian coast where we have a lot of capacity transiting from, uh, from Asia. But if we look at what some of the bottlenecks are, certainly the cost availability and reliability of terrestrial distribution is holding back the benefits that we could get. The ability for us to move data inland to reach to not only the hinterland countries, those that are landlocked, but also to those, that, uh, those cities that are just well away from our existing infrastructure and our competitors' inf existing infrastructure is very high. In some countries, it costs twice as much to go halfway up the coast as it does to go from the capital city to London. Okay. That is not going to work and it's not going to be a sustainable model for obviously distributing the benefit that can accrue. Landlocked countries have particular other problems. Not only do they have to transit another country to get the capacity inland, and to get the infrastructure inland, they've also got to negotiate how to get across a border. And there's not a lot of experience in doing that, though I think it's starting to change, it's starting to improve. Some of the uh, organisations that are meeting regularly and trying to develop that are having some progress. But they're also constrained a bit like by the, many of the models of traditional telcos, where trying to protect your monopoly is much more valuable than trying to open up things and, and compete effectively. So we know that all elements of this ecosystem need to evolve rapidly. And we also know that until that's achieved, then we're not going to get the full benefits of broadband for all. Reliability is a critical net issue. It wouldn't probably be so much if I could find four different routes to get from Mombasa to Kampala, okay? But it is hard to find four reliable routes to get from Mombasa to Kampala. It is also impossible to buy those routes and basically mesh them and make money out of selling them given the price that they, uh, that they quite currently cost. So what we have to do is we have to continue to work with many of our backhaul service providers and they have to keep on finding new ways to improve that reliability. That means that we've got to cut down on the number of unnecessary cuts that happen, number of times that faults occur because of basically fingers in the network, which will probably still remain the most common cause of faults. And we probably have to do some education to explain to people that fibre is not copper and that probably cutting through it will kill you rather than enable you to make some money at the scrap metal merchants. Fibre enter enterprises is unaffordable without critical mass. And the chicken and the egg problem here is not that there aren't enterprises that could use broadband more effectively, but they're not. Okay? I still get to meet with banks that are running branches on 2 meg and 5 meg services. In the rest of the world, that's unheard of. In the rest of the world, when you talk to the large banks, the global banks, they're running multiple, net, multiple 10G waves different ways around. They're running major data centres and their distribution and their reliability on, uh, their reliance, sorry, on, uh, uh, on applications and on productivity suites and on technology is enormously high. We haven't got to that point yet. So for enterprises to grow, they also have to be ready and willing to invest in this technology to take advantage of it. 
At the same time, we need to make sure that people like DFA, Fiberco, and others who are building fibre throughout uh, eastern and southern Africa continue to push it into many of these technology parks and other enterprise parks that are developing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you've seen the rest of it. If I find the right button, that'll be good. Okay. Um, the following elements are key to, uh, to leveraging them. We've got to have intra-African connectivity working basically through a combination of not just international providers like ourselves at the subsea level, but regional, national, long haul and metro access. There has to be a level of cooperation and, co and competition. In the telecoms world globally, we call this cooperation. It happens every day. We compete and we cooperate. We are slowly starting to get that model to work with some carriers, both our direct competitors as well as partners within, uh, uh, within domestic markets. But it is a slow progress because the maturing of the market takes a while. We need to get FTTX, whether it be to businesses, to homes, to nodes, to multiple dwelling units and getting cabling going up through uh, major uh, residential buildings and mobile to the masses that is actually going to deliver high broadband capability. We need data centres that are local, carrier neutral, and we also need supporting those internet exchanges and meet me points that are also local and carrier neutral and where people recognise the value of peering and exchanging content on a very open basis. At the moment, when you look at what happens in many of the markets we operate in, there is still a lot of protection of data. Peering is still very much from a paid perspective. And in fact, if you look at the cost structure uh, for ISPs within South Africa at the moment, the major costs are in peering and interconnection. I think there was some work done recently which shows that probably the international component of an ISP, the cost there is probably down well below 5%, in fact approaching 2%, whereas the rest of the costs remain domestic. IP-based networks are increasingly becoming attractive. I think when CECOM started, we saw that there was an enormous interest in basically finding cheaper ways to get to content in the US and people, everybody, uh, sorry, and in Europe. Everybody wanted to own their own STEM1 or STEM4, their own physical connection, and they wanted to be able to connect to somebody in uh, Telehouse North or Telehouse East in London and, uh, and manage their upstream provider for their IP. Increasingly, what we're finding is that people now recognise that unless you're actually a very big ISP and have a lot of expertise, the cost of owning and operating and trying to terminate your own traffic all over the place is quite problematic. And it also quite often means that you single thread and you don't diversify your network and you are open to what are the inevitable problems, whether they be domestic or, and terrestrial or whether they be subsea that come from cable cuts and failures and equipment failures. IP networks are meshed. And we've seen over the last 12 months especially that with a lot of our customers, the abil our ability to mesh those networks, to be able to deliver the IP and get the content, whether it's coming from Mumbai, whether it's coming from London, Marseille, Frankfurt, uh, and whether it's going up the East Coast or around the West Coast, is much more attractive than being able to manage your one STEM1 or your STEM4 to London. It also offers a, basically a pay-as-you-grow model for building your network. So instead of having to take very lumpy capacity, we're finding that we can support lots of smaller ISPs who are looking to grow and they can start at 30 megabytes and go up. And they ha immediately have the diversity that our IP network can offer. We need to see cloud and mobile integration into basic mobile services and we need to get much more content locally here. Our future cannot be about how quickly and how cheaply can we get to content in the US or in Europe. It has to be about how do we get that content into the African continent and how do we get African content into those distribution networks as well. And we're seeing that starting to happen. We're seeing major content players, whether they be Google, Akamai, Amazon, starting to bring their content. In many cases, they host it with us and we put it into our cable stations and our data centres 
and we're bringing it here to Africa. That improves not only the reliability and the speed of access to that, but it also improves the resilience because to some extent, aside from the sinking activity that goes on, we're taking out the risk of having to go off continent and go elsewhere for it. And we do need a well-oiled regulatory environment. Without a regulatory environment that protects the consumer, that enables development and investment and encourages it, and also pushes towards a competitive environment, then we're going to continue to be constrained no matter what the operators try to do. That has to be a key component. We need to see a lot of cooperation, especially in Africa, where on the continent we have so many countries. We need to see a lot of cooperation between regulators as well to help facilitate many of those cross-border connections. Now, this isn't all about what others can do. People like CECOM, WIOC, Ryan, good to see you, uh, and uh, many of the others. And there are, most of the major telecom players now would, are effectively international operators. They own capacity, whether they bought it from CECOMs or whether they're members of WACs and EASY and Teams consortiums. All of these players can cooperate and start to work as a network of cables. No customer should be really dependent upon one physical route, whether that be terrestrial or subsea. We've got to have network offerings. We've got to have full IP services, and we've got to deliver those on east-west breakouts. And a little, shortly, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing to improve that at Seacom. You've got to have partnerships with terrestrial and last mile providers to help them develop, and also to be able to deliver back-to-back -back service level agreements. Nothing changes as quickly as customers' expectations. So when it's, it's very, all very well to say yesterday you didn't have connectivity, now you've got connectivity, surely you can't be complaining about the fact that it was down for an hour, doesn't work with customers. Customers can go very quickly from, okay, yesterday I may have had nothing, but now that I've got it, I don't want to lose it. We need to be able to deliver service level agreements that are actually going to back up what we're selling and how it performs. Partnership models to utilise existing fibre are also critical. The telecoms industry has an amazing capability to spend money and to overbuild. And if we don't have partnership models to share fibre, then in a place like Africa, what's going to happen is that we will overinvest in certain areas and not have enough capital to invest in other areas that need it. And we need to find ways to husband what is fairly rare capital and invest appropriately. In many cases, we already see too much fibre in going in the ground on certain routes. And given what I was saying before about how much capacity you can throw down a fibre nowadays, and when you think about terrestrial fibres being anywhere from 48 core up, then that is an enormous amount of capacity that you can potentially do there. And the question is, can we distribute that investment much better and get more bang for our buck at the end of the day? Exchange points are critical. If we're going to have an internet environment that works well, we need to be able to peer, we need to be able to find the shortest route to content and data, and we need this to work very effectively. You cannot run an app that is dependent upon always bouncing up to London, collect data to go back. That's a 260 millisecond round trip, I think, and pretty soon that becomes just an unbearable delay in the processing. But if we can provide that content much more locally, if we can have RTDs, round trip delays that are down around the sub 100 milliseconds route, then we're going to see much better performance and much better take up in terms of, uh, in terms of applications. And uh, at CECOM, we're also building a wholesale cloud services platform through our subsidiary Pomosia that is about, as I said before, changing the way that global content players think about Africa, bringing that content in bringing the capability, whether it be software or platforms as a service, and helping to create local services through resellers and other telco partners, uh, and to also get the aggregation of international services within Africa. Now, some time ago, we announced that uh, we were looking at basically uh, closing the ring. And uh, as many of you know, and you saw from the map previously, the Seacom cable at the moment lands in uh, Ntanzini, just north of Durban. And uh, we have quite a bit of capacity also that comes out of Asa Fontaine 
uh, and goes the west uh, route of the, uh, of the coast. And uh, what we're looking at doing is building what we're, as a working name only at the moment, calling the SAMS, the South African Marine System, which would run from Mpumzini to Azafontaine and into Cape Town, in fact, and uh, also uh, have uh, branching units and drop-offs as we go down the, uh, the coast uh, in East London and, uh, and Port Elizabeth. Sorry, we're going to have to ask you to move. Only because I can't remember exactly what's on there, and I may get it wrong. So why are we building another cable? Well, um, given that there is so much fibre being put in the ground, we do see that subsea for these routes, and uh, uh, for some investors in SAMS, the interest will be about more about local traffic. For some of us, it will be more about what we call the express route, basically hooking up the systems that are on the east coast and getting them around to the west coast systems. But we see that subsea is probably a higher performance for a number of reasons, both in terms of reliability. It's certainly a lower cost to build um, once you get uh, some of the basic work. And we're just about to start the process of uh, doing the surveys and the cores that are required in the environmental approvals uh, in the coming weeks. Um, then the process of actually building a cable system there's no roadways, there's no bridge crossings, there's not too many uh, specially protected fog, uh, frog uh, uh, groupings uh, out uh, 200 kilometres off the coast. So we can get on and lay this very quickly. This has always been, for SECOM, the missing piece. And in fact, it was part of uh, original thoughts, but it never got built. Um, it provides redundancy into the Eastern Cape region. And this remains a region that as yet is underserved by terrestrial fibre. The development continues. Um, and from our very personal perspective, it is a natural extension of what we do, our operations and capability. Having built it, it fits very simply into the way we operate our cable systems. Uh, better performance and lower cost to do so. Um, it gives us protection. We will still have quite a bit of terrestrial fibre. Uh, as I was saying before, we're also looking for diversity. But we will now get that diversity uh, through the uh, subsea as well. It is more resilient and reliable. It won't be hit as often. It is lower, much lower cost to operate than a terrestrial network, which is more liable to get, uh, uh, to get physical interruption. And as I said before, it closes the ring. So uh, in coming weeks, we will probably uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what we're doing and who's going to do the initial work, the surveys and the marine approvals. We expect this will probably be up late next year. Uh, and, uh, um, but at the moment, subject to environmental approval, we don't see too many issues in getting it built. So some takeaways. The obvious one from Economics 101. Any market is a function of supply and demand. Whilst we talk a lot about supply, we have to realise the close relationship between and supply and demand. As I said before, we see an enormous gap between potential demand and actual demand. And that gap is largely hampered and caused by the lack of supply in critical issues like not only fibre, last mile, high speed data, and mobile data, but also all the other infrastructure elements that make up the ecosystem. So that constraint in terms of inland supply is effectively constraining demand. And we think that that is frustrating not only potential users, but also it is slowing, holding back quite a bit of development that's uh, potential there because we know that there is a strong correlation between broadband usage and economic growth for developing countries. It has been proven many times. Okay? And there are enormous benefits to be done. So much work remains to be done on addressing this issue in the whole infrastructure ecosystem, both for IP and just infrastructure generally. And as I mentioned before, whilst we push to do that, the telecoms industry has really got to manage this issue of overbuild and overspend in certain areas. Because otherwise, we will be simply repeating many of the stakes, mistakes that we have seen in many other places in the world in the telecoms industry, where we waste capital unnecessarily, we end up not being able to recover, and therefore some companies will go under. So for us all to be successful, there needs to be quite a bit of cooperation. There needs to be consideration of these things. 
and for Africa to be successful, that also needs to occur. Thanks very much.